My name is Dan Litchfield, and I'm a project developer with Iberdrola Renewables. I'm based out of Chicago. I primarily work on projects in the Illinois and Ohio, but I am getting involved in uh, helping one of my coworkers on the development of the Wild Meadows project here in New Hampshire. So I have a presentation here on wind energy and what goes into developing projects, and I'll just go through that. Uh, first, a little bit about our company. Uh, my employer is called Iberdrola Renewables. It is based in Spain, but we have a large presence in the United States. As you can see on this map, each of the uh, wind turbine symbols is an operating project. We're about to add our second symbol here in New Hampshire uh, when our Groton project goes online. Uh, but we're all over the country. Uh, we go where the wind is, where the permitting conditions and de development conditions are right, and also where the market is good uh, for our for, for us to sell our product, uh, which is energy and RECs, uh, Renewable Energy Certificates. So that basically is a piece of paper that says any given unit of energy is a renewable unit. And some people, some entities will pay extra for that. Uh, in most of the markets I'm familiar with, it's not very valuable right now, but it is an extra stream of revenue for us. Uh, but our company also uh, has one combined cycle natural gas plant here in Southern Oregon. Uh, all these S symbols are natural gas storage units, either that we own or that we're under contract with. And um, we do now have two solar ranches. Um, the Southern Colorado project here is 30 megawatts. It's 300 acres of PV panels. And the Arizona project is 20 megawatts, so about 200 acres. Um, but we've, we have a lot of projects here clustered in the upper Midwest. You can see it's very windy. Uh, but I think we're going to be really slowing our work in that area because uh, we're not running out of wind, but we're running out of capacity on the transmission lines. We're moving to markets where there's existing transmission capacity so we can get our product to market, and there's demand. So that brings us, uh, we're going to be staying busy in the New England area, uh, in Ohio, uh, possibly in the south. We actually have a project uh, in eastern North Carolina that's ready, and uh, California and the Western states remain good markets for us. So the two projects we now have in, in New Hampshire, one is called Lumpster. It is 24 megawatts, 12 wind turbines, went online uh, almost four years ago. Uh, permitting is handled by the New Hampshire Site Evaluation Committee, and these 12 wind turbines will produce enough power for about 10,000 New Hampshire homes. Uh, the Groton Wind Project is just coming online right now. It is twice as big, 48 megawatts, 24 wind turbines, also permitting at the state level and enough power for 20,000 homes. Uh, the new project we're working on is called Wild Meadows. It would be uh, possibly 74 megawatts, 37 turbines, so just a little bit bigger than the first two combined and enough power for 30,000 homes. And it's actually going to use a different turbine model that will be more productive than the, these first ones. Uh, these first two projects both use this model, wind turbine. Uh, the manufacturer is Gamesa. The model number is G87. And it is rated at 2 megawatts. Uh, Gamesa is another Spanish company like Iberdrola. They have a factory in Pennsylvania where most of these are made. Um, and it is not the only turbine we use, but it's one we've used a lot of in the past five years since I've been working uh, for Iberdrola Renewables. Um, it has a 78 meter tower height, which is 256 feet, so that's uh, about 85 yards, um, 85 yards high. The blades are 143 feet long. That gives us a total height from blade to top of a tip when it's straight up of almost 400 feet. The diameter of the rotor is 87 meters, and that's why the model is called the G87. That's 285 feet or about 95 yards. And this is a, probably the most important factor for selecting a wind turbine model. The ratio of the area, swept area of the rotor to the generator size. So on the G87, it's, it's a little, just a tad less than 1.5 acres. So these machines allow us to collect kinetic energy blowing through 1.5 acres of space, of sky. Um, now the the Wild Meadows wind turbines, those are called G97s. For one, they'll be on a 90-meter tower instead of 78, so they're 40 feet taller, putting us up higher into the air where the wind speeds are higher. 
but the, the area of the road will be 1.8 acres. So that's a big change. That's 20% improvement on the same 2 megawatt generator. That's going to make the turbines a lot more efficient, uh, much more productive, particularly at lower wind speeds, and it should make our, our cost of power cheaper. How much is 2 megawatts? It's hard for many people to put a, a, a real reality to that number. So that's, uh, in English terms, it's 2,700 horsepower. So I, I work in the Midwest, I tell the farmers it's five top-of-the-line tractors worth of power. Uh, and of course that's when the wind is blowing, it's not always going to do that. Uh, but throughout the course of the year, each wind turbine will generate enough power for about 800 average houses. So it's big power. Uh, also we generate power at 34,500 volts. So a lot higher than you would find even in a normal industrial space, you might have 480 volt, three phase. We do have three phase power, but it's significantly higher. Um, now, the United States has a tremendous wind resource, mainly in the center of the country. The red, as you can see, is really windy. But there's plenty of pockets elsewhere, and there's demand for renewable energy elsewhere. So that's my job and my coworkers to go out and find these sites and uh, manage the planning and the development of these projects so they're ready for construction. Uh, here's a map of New Hampshire and kind of a close-up of, of this area uh, so you can see where the wind is. And, and in general, um, where it's lower, elevations are lower, it's not windy. And the, the higher wind areas are up on top of the ridges. And that's because as the wind uh, flows across the surface of the earth, if there's a bump, like a mountain, it's got to speed up to get over that bump. So at the top of the mountain, that's where it's going to be highest, and that's where we want to put our wind turbines. Uh, but these are just estimates. These maps are just estimates. And it costs us, in New Hampshire, up to $6 million per 2 megawatt turbine to build. So we're not going to spend that kind of money unless we know what the wind resource is, so we know what our generation will be, which we know what, our, therefore we know what our sales will be, therefore we know how we can pay back that investment. So before we uh, advance a project into development, we gather wind data. And uh, we use, primarily we use MET towers, meteorological towers. Standard height is 200 feet, 60 meters, just under 200 feet. And these are precision scientific instruments for measuring wind speed and wind direction. Uh, in New Hampshire, we, we run into a challenge where the terrain is complex with the different ridges and valleys. And we have to put up a lot of measurement towers to get representative data for any given site. So we've discovered a new tool, uh, a device called the Wind Cube made by NRG Systems, which also is a manufacturer of the towers. And WindCube uses a laser, and it's a box maybe a foot and a half cubed. Uh, we can put it in you know, minimal space. Uh, it, we do need some propane tanks to, to run, it, uh, run it, but it's a lot simpler and a lot cheaper and a lot faster to go up than a measurement tower. Now, it, the cost to buy one is more expensive. That device is about a quarter of a million dollars, but the data we get from it is priceless. So we, we'll do this campaign for multiple years, a minimum of two years. Many projects have five or six years of data before we build. And we gather all this data. We go, we find a long-term source of data, like an airport, that might have 30 or 40 years of data at 10 meters above ground level. And we look for a correlation. And if we find a correlation, we can use statistics, math, to predict very accurately what the wind is going to do over the next 20 or 30 years. And that gives pretty good certainty of what uh, we can sell, our, you know, how much power we'll be able to sell. And also because we build re a relatively expensive machine, but then we get our fuel for free, we can sell our power on fixed price contracts. So we'll, we'll look for utility to buy the output from a project at a fixed price or a series of fixed prices for 20 years. So we provide uh, affordable, clean power, and stable price power, and that is a big financial advantage uh, of wind energy. So now a little math for you. Where does the power come from? Uh, the equation for available power in the wind is this, and the different factors, P is power, uh, that low, little p is actually the Greek letter rho, and it's the air density. This, this space here seems empty, but it's actually full of air. And it's not heavy, but it does have some density. The typical value is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter, or about two and a half pounds per cubic yard. 
And that does change a little bit. It's generally going to be higher, heavier, denser in the winter. But it doesn't vary very much, that much. There's nothing you can do about it anyway. But well, that is one of the factors. The next one, A, is the swept area of the rotor. And area is pi times the radius squared, or pi times the diameter squared over 4. So the important thing to note there is a square function of diameter. So if we double the diameter, we get four times the power, not double the power. So bigger blades have a big influence on being able to capture more power. And then V is the wind velocity, and it's a cubic force. So double the wind speed means eight times the power. So that's the most important thing. We've got to find windy areas. And then the, tech, the change in technology from the turbine manufacturers allows these bigger blades that are strong enough to handle turbulent winds and the, the enormous loads on them from being so big and long, um, but light enough to spin and durable enough to withstand lightning and, and the turbulence. Oh, and then we typically use meters per second for wind speed, which is two and a quarter miles per hour. Uh, here's a typical power curve. I think this is actually from the Gamesa G90. So it'll cut in at 9 miles per hour. When you have winds of 9 miles per hour, you'll begin generating power. The output of the machine will increase as wind speed increases. Uh, and then at about at 27 miles per hour, we're at almost full power. Um, there, we will then operate at full power until 56 miles per hour. So the wind turbine does all this automatically. It can yaw or turn itself uh, as if the wind changes direction. And then the blades will constantly pitch as needed uh, to capture the, the optimal amount of wind. So uh, the, the blades are like airplane wings. And if you've ever flown a plane or flown in a plane and you've seen the flaps come out, you know, flaps are used to change the shape of the airfoil to generate the right amount of lift to keep the plane in the air based on the wind, the airspeed it has. So, same thing here with the wind turbine. The blades will pitch as needed to keep the, the rotor spinning. And then after, when we get up to full power, they will pitch to let wind slip by to maintain a constant output on the generator. Uh, so they'll, the turbine will operate until 56 miles per hour. And then if we have sustained wind speeds above that, it'll shut down for safety. There's a large break. Um, so we can't generate power all the time. If we, get, if we had a hurricane, we would have a tremendous amount of energy, but that would just be too much for the machine. That doesn't happen very often, so we're not losing out on much. And this window of 9 to 56 miles per hour is about 80% of the time. So we'll not always be generating the full 2 megawatts, but 80% of the time we'll be generating something between 0 and 2 megawatts per turbine. <clears throat> now, this is a table that will take some time to, to, uh, to look at, but I show you this just to show the progression in technology. Uh, four different Gamesa models and then a GE turbine, which I'll get to in the end. But uh, the G83s, we were building in Iowa in 2007 when I started working. Uh, the 87s we built in Illinois and Iowa and here. Uh, G90s we just built in Ohio. And then the G97 is going to be the next turbine we look at building here in New Hampshire and some other places. But you can see the big difference in swept area. And then this, this final column on the right, power density, square meters of swept area per kilowatt of capacity. And to put those into English units, the G87 has 24 square feet of, of area per horsepower of capacity. The G97 has 30 square feet of area per horsepower of capacity. So just think about how much energy can flow through 30 square feet. Look at the ductwork, and you know the cross-sectional area of that is a foot and a half, maybe two square feet. Thirty square feet, there's a lot of energy available in that amount of air, and that's what we're doing. Now, currently, worldwide, the most power-dense turbine available is made by General Electric. It's called the GE 1.6 100. So it's only a 1.6 megawatt generator. It's smaller than these, but it's got a 100-meter diameter rotor. So it's kind of souped up. It's, it's got a supercharger rotor. It's this huge blade on a small machine. It's got a swept area of uh, 4.9 square meters per kilowatt. So you put this in a low wind, relatively low wind area like Ohio, maybe even you know, Alabama, and you get pretty close to being, you, you get as close as you've ever been to being economically feasible uh, in low wind areas. And 
This is the, the main trend in uh, wind energy technology, longer blades and getting them to work on, uh, on increasingly larger machines. Um, you also have to make sure your machine is rated for your area. That's the other reason we gather all this wind data. The, the GE 1.6100, we, we could not put in Iowa or South Dakota. It's too windy there, and there, there's too many big gusts. It would overload the machine too often. But your capacity factor, the, the average, the representation of how often it's generating full power would be much higher with that type of machine. So now I'll get into the construction uh, a little bit. One of the big challenges we have in, in New England and, and these projects in New Hampshire we've built uh, is the terrain. And we have uh, some pictures I'll show. We have some really big pieces that we have to get up the mountain to build these machines. So we have to spend some time and energy and money building these roads that are capable of handling these big uh, components. Uh, so we, we build roads. Um, that, that sometimes requires a lot of blasting to uh, get the, the grade we need in these, with these uh, mountains. And the challenge from a permitting standpoint is, is the way water runs off the mountains. We're still held to very high standards for erosion. Um, we cannot cause major changes in the way water flows. We can't cause the mountain to erode away. So we've got to engineer and construct these very carefully to make sure there's a way for water to go that doesn't haul the mountain down piece by piece. Uh, then we build our foundations. Um, here with the mountain, we use what's called a rock anchor foundation. So we have a minimal concrete structure, and what you see in this picture is mostly the steel rebar. And then um, these large uh, bolts are rock anchors. They go 40 feet into the mountain, and we'll pour the concrete on top of this, and all that will be visible will be this ring of bolts in the middle, which is uh, typically 144 bolts, inch and a quarter in diameter. And that is what the bottom of the tower bolts to. So that is a very strong, stable base for this very tall, top-heavy machine we're, we're building. Um, then we get the big, big pieces coming in. Blades 140 feet or more long. Tower sections. Uh, the shortest section is the base, which is about maybe 55 feet tall, but it's 13 feet in diameter. And then when you get to the top of the tower, it tapers, but the top section is 90 feet long and uh, maybe 10 feet in diameter. Uh, here is a picture of a nacelle being transported. Here's the word uh, nacelle. That's the name for the box at the top. And that's where the gearbox, generator, and all the controls are. Gamesa also puts the transformer up there. The generator actually will generate power of 690 volts. And then we step it up in the nacelle at 34,500 and go down tower. But the Gamesa nacelle weighs 85 tons. So we've got to spend a lot of time making sure we've got... Uh, strong enough roads to get there and the right route that's wide enough and tall enough and strong enough to get these big pieces uh, to where they need to go. Here's a cutaway view inside the nacelle. Uh, we've got the rotor, uh, the typically three blades and the hub bolted on. Uh, right inside that is our gearbox and the Gamesa turbine turbines it's 100, I think 120 to 1 uh, gearbox. So the rotor spins relatively slowly, 19 revolutions per minute. So that's about one blade passing a tower once per second, or three seconds for one blade to go all the way around. So watching them spin, it's, it's a relatively low, slow, lazy speed. You can easily see that. But those blades are long, so the tip speed can be 200 miles per hour. Uh, so we've got our gearbox. That feeds into our generator. The generator is an electric motor but it operates in reverse. Electric motor, you provide electricity and it gives you rotation. Generator is the opposite. You provide a rotation and it gives you electricity. So we have that there in a close alignment, obviously large, heavy device for handling the amount of power. And then we have the, the yaw controls to turn the turbine, pitch controls, generator, um, all the other the cooling system for the machine. And on top of the nacelle, you see here we have some uh, wind instruments. Each machine has its own anemometer and wind vane. And it's controlled independently. Uh, they, are, they, they do operate automatically. We maintain control over them. Uh, during the day, our, our technicians on site control the turbines. And then at, at night and on weekends, holidays, we have a control center in Portland, Oregon, our headquarters. We do 24 7 supervision of all of our turbines uh, at, from one centralized facility. 
Here's a picture for scale. This is actually out of the project I just worked on in Ohio. We don't build them this way, but this is, a, I think, a great picture to show the scale of these machines uh, next to these people. Um, in Ohio, there's plenty of space in these cornfields, so we build the road around the ground and then pick it up in one, person, one piece. Uh, New Hampshire, we don't clear the land that much to do that, um, so uh, we, we put the blades on one at a time, like you see here. We have the large crane that lifts the tower sections one at a time, and then the, the nacelle the and then the blades. Um, two things about this is that uh, the crane is amazing. Uh, you know, the top hub height of this is 256 feet, so the crane is bigger. It's self-propelled. It walks from one side to the next. It weighs a million and a half pounds, fully assembled. Uh, so it's quite a piece of machinery. Uh, the other thing, the other catch-22 about wind energy is that we build machines designed to catch the wind in windy spaces. But then if it's too windy on the day you're constructing it, uh, you can't lift it for safety. And so sometimes the schedule gets delayed if it's too windy. And sometimes this work with the blades particularly will do at night if it happens to be calmer um, so that we can get the lift done safely. The turbine itself can get stacked up really quickly. This can be done in a day and a half. Um, but there's a, uh, a lot of work ahead of time to build the roads, build the foundation, build the electrical system. And then once you get it up, you got to do all the wiring, and there's uh, so many different tests and checks before you can start running the turbine. turbines. Where does electricity go? Um, so we generate power in the wind farm, and we put our power onto a high-voltage transmission system, symbolized by these towers here. Um, typically, this is at 138,000 volts and above, um, and these are our electricity superhighways for moving electricity from, from one power plant to major load centers and connecting all the power plants into a, a great big network. Uh, there will be substations like this that will lower the voltage to a more usable scale and then smaller poles that carry power to homes and schools and businesses. And so we're on the wholesale side, we generate masses amounts, amounts of energy, and we, we plug into the, the major grid. And that's it, I put up here two uh, websites, uh, one for our Groton project, and then one for our Wild Meadows project. When you watch this, it will probably be in the permitting stage and then hopefully eventually the operating operation stage for Wild Meadows. And we'll be posting a whole bunch of documents on there. Uh, we pride ourselves on our transparency, and a lot of these documents are, are public record anyway. Um, so if you want to learn about the project, learn exactly where the turbines are going to go, you want to read about the wildlife studies, the archaeological studies, historic architecture studies, etc., um, they'll all be on there. And there's my email address, too, if you have any questions. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you. Can we ask you a couple of questions, by the way? Sure. What, um... What are the biggest impediments, biggest limitations on um, wind projects? Once you've, once you've found the site that's appropriate, what are the biggest impediments to getting that built? Well, the current biggest impediment is the market. Um, since the recession began in 2008, demand for electricity is down, that has driven the price down. So a company like us that generates power, uh, that's not good, too. That's not an incentive to build new projects. But there are other mechanisms that are incentives, such as state renewable portfolio standards. Uh, the other big thing on the market side is natural gas. There's so much natural gas in the U.S. now. Prices way down. That also has driven wholesale power prices down. So you see coal plants going out of business, not because of regulation, just because they can't compete with gas. So when that's happening, you, it's just another incentive or indication that it's not a good time to build a new project, whether it's wind or anything else. Uh, Site-specific. Um, we try to do a lot of homework, our homework up ahead, so we, we want to know if there's any obvious environmental risks. Uh, we want to know that the, the wind is good or should be good before we do our, a lot of money permitting, and then, um, and then what the community reception is. Um, sometimes there's going to be some people who, who have a different opinion as to whether there should be a wind farm or not. So that, that's the phase we're in now with Wild Meadows and trying to answer people's questions about you know, what are the facts. and do wind farms cause property values to go down? And the data, what have you found about that? The data today shows there's no, there's no relation. Uh, some people don't like them, and some people will sell their houses. Uh, there's, there's a national study that shows that looked at 
I don't know, 8,000 plus house sales. They used controls, they made sure all the transactions were at arm's length, and there was no statistical effect on residential property values. Uh, an Illinois study I'm familiar with showed that there was a decrease when a project was announced. I, I believe it's because some people wanted to get out and they sold what they could and they left. But when the project went online, there was no statistical effect. Um, so that's that's the data on property values. Do you know anything about the data on bird and bat kill? Yes, uh, birds and the risk to birds and bats is real. It's something we take very seriously. We have we're the only company in the industry that has a voluntary avian and bat protection plan. We we work in some jurisdictions where we don't have any requirements for birds and bats. And in those cases, we do studies anyway because we know it's the right thing to do. New Hampshire is not one of those areas. Uh, we'll be doing, we are doing a, a detailed analysis of uh, are there endangered species that live in the area, are there migratory, is this a migratory path, and the, the research, research so far shows it's not a major risk to wildlife. Uh, nationwide, from all the wind farms in the country, somewhere between 150 and 200,000 birds and bats are killed every year. By wind? By wind. And they are killed by cars. Well, you got to put that in context by human activity. The number one killer of birds and bats is buildings, just birds flying into glass windows. Mm -hmm. And that number is 55 million. And how many did you say from wind? 150 to 200,000. Mm -hmm. You know, transmission lines, cars, mm -hmm. cats. Look at other, and compare directly, apples to apples. What are other forms of generation? Maybe there's not many, there's some birds that are killed by flying into coal, you know, mm -hmm. smokestacks, but... What about the whole process? What about mining the coal? What about habitat destruction there? What about train transport of coal? Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the life cycle and you, you give an honest look at that, you'll see wind energy is very, uh, is very uh, low risk to wildlife compared to others. And the most important thing, the most damaging threat they face nowadays is climate change. We have no greenhouse gas emissions. We have no water use. We have no uh, other air emissions like nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides. These are all important things that need to be considered in, in an analysis of what, of what is the risk. Uh, other things that I brought with me, um, my noise meter. And uh, maybe the camera can pick up the numbers here, we'll see. But uh, some people say, are, are wind turbines loud? Are they going to keep me up at night? Uh, sometimes you can't hear wind turbines. Um, they're not totally silent. Mainly the noise you hear is a swishing noise as the blades pass the tower. But um, we're held to very strict standards. Uh, for the Wild Meadows project, we'll be at 45 decibels or less. And, so the, the, and these are measuring decimals? This is measuring decibels right with now. With one-tenth to a tenth of a decibel. Yeah, so if we're... So we're at the range of 50, 60.55.4... 60, so we're between 55 and 60 decibels here. Talking. Well, uh, okay, be silent for a second. Be silent, I say. So we're in the just below 50 range. You're just below 50 just by the, the sound of the HVAC in the room. So For those of you who have sat in this classroom, so, you know what he's talking about. Yeah, so when you get, get to brass tacks and you look at, let's, let's not talk about are they loud, are they noisy, quantify it. They're not loud, as you can as you can tell. And that's a, a strict legal standard we're held to. Um, another big thing is um, shadow flipping. The blades are big; they move depending on the angle of the sun. Um, you're going to have shadows that move on the ground. So uh, that's something we have to study, and we have to. And you, you can do that very accurately. You find the latitude, longitude, the turbines, their elevation, where the houses are. You run into this computer program. And you can find out at what time of year and, and total minutes of shadow flicker on someone's house. And typically that'll be from July 1st to August 15th. There's going to be uh, from 7.52 in the morning till 8.12. And that'll you know come and go throughout that period. There'll be shadows on your house. So close your blinds if you don't like it. We'll be held to a, a maximum. Um, I actually don't know what it's going to be for Wild Meadows. In Ohio, it's 30 hours a year. We cannot cause cumulatively 30 hours of shadow flicker. So that's saying 99.7% of the time there won't be shadow flicker. That's a pretty tough standard. And shadow flicker can be a nuisance. I'm not going to deny that. But it's not a health risk. The flicker of the blades is once per second. 
Some people will claim it'll trigger epileptic seizures. There's no evidence that it'll do that. But you, you combine the sound, the shadow, and some people claim there's this thing called wind turbine syndrome. There's this kind of magic uh, low frequency noise from the wind turbines. It's just not true. Uh, there have been detailed analyses of these claims of wind turbine syndrome, and they, they just do not exist. And the, the one other kind of co common claim you hear is the view. I don't like the way these look. They're going to ruin my view. The physics, like I showed through in my presentation, that's why the heck they're so big. The bigger the rotor, the more power we're going to generate, the more feasible it's going to be, and that's why they're big. We can't hide them. They've got to be painted white for safety, for visibility, for planes. So um, you can't hide them. Beauty is in the, high, the, the eye of the beholder. A lot of people I talk to find them graceful and majestic, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. to get sun towers disguised as trees. <laughs> <laughs> or big stacks of... You know, belching smoke. Right, right. So, um, one of the things I've heard about wind projects are the one of the biggest things to overcome is the first cost. How how do these get financed? Well, that's yeah. They're kind of at a just the the, the structure, the economic structure of this project. These projects, we don't we don't pay for fuel, so we pay for a relatively expensive machine. And then he but gets who free pays fuel. For the relatively expensive machine? In, in our case, Iberdrola Renewables does. We we raise capital independently. A lot of our competitors, smaller competitors, will do uh, project financing, so they'll get a loan for each project. We typically have not done that. We have. So then you sell a power uh, uh, purchase agreement? Yeah. We find a utilities? utility. Uh, we have a new customer in Ohio. Ohio State University is buying uh, 50 megawatts from our project there. Uh, they're going to. It's going to supply 25 percent of the campus energy needs. So, mm -hmm. we're trying to expand that side of our business using you know direct customers, energy users, factories, universities. Uh, we've got a group of hospitals in Pennsylvania that buy from us. But we want to find a customer that wants to buy clean power, that wants to uh, and wants to have a hedge and wants to know what some portion of their power is going to cost for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. And so we we have to look at our costs up front, our projected revenue, and and sell, a, sell for a price that makes the cost justifiable. So, I mean, these are big projects. The, um, you know, in, in rough numbers, the the Wild Meadows project uh, will cost uh, two hundred twenty million dollars. Uh, the project we just built in Ohio, which is much bigger, one hundred fifty-two wind turbines, was six hundred million dollars. What's the lifespan of these machines? Uh, Twenty years as our economic life. Uh, typically, our wind leases are fifty years. We don't. We don't. Uh, that's part of my job as a developer is to get the land. We don't buy it; typically, we, we rent it, mm -hmm. and it's another use of the land. Whatever, whether it's farming in the Midwest or timber harvesting here, uh, that can continue. We take up just a little bit of the land, uh, but the lease is 50 years. The foundation and the tower have a 50-year design life, mm -hmm. and we model a 20 to 25-year economic life. So, 20 or 25 years from now, we. we Bless you. Upgrading all these new towers uh, to new equipment. We may be taking them down and cleaning up and restoring. Uh, that's, that's another question that we get a lot. What's going to happen when we're done? What if we go bankrupt and we leave the towers? Uh, we have to post an independent financial instrument like a bond yeah. so that if we go bankrupt or if we're unwilling, there's money there to take them down. And typically, that could t the, the removal could be funded by the value of the wind turbines, the scrap. Even if they're not reusable, if they can't be rebuilt, which is unlikely, there's 300, 350 tons of steel in each turbine. Depending on what scrap prices are like 20, 25 years from now, that could totally fund the cost of removing these. Interesting. Uh, what, um, what government policies would you like to see enacted that would support the growth of the wind, wind as an industry? The main thing that we're advocating for right now is a renewal of the production tax credit. This has been in place on and off since 1992. It's really been in place and in use since 2007, as the industry has really boomed and grown since then, which is coincidentally when I started. Uh, it provides a tax credit of 2.2 cents per kilowatt hour of production. So we can't just build a turbine and forget about it. We have to actually run it, keep it, keep it uh, operating, and then we get the credit. Um, and that provides another revenue stream for, for us. Um, energy is not a free market. Opponents of the PTC will say that wind energy needs to compete on its own. Too much subsidy. Well, everything we compete against is subsidized one way or the other. Um, 
natural gas drilling, oil drilling, those, they have drilling costs that can be tax write-offs. See the chart on my wall there? There you go. That, that's exactly. We showed that around quite a bit. Um, there was a, a tax credit for ethanol for a number of years. Nuclear energy has the Price-Anderson Act that provides liability insurance for uh, nuclear plants that would not be able to operate, and they cannot buy the insurance independently. I'm not saying these things should go away. We need to have energy, and uh, inexpensive energy has been the standard policy for a long time. But just don't pretend it's a free market and, and renewables are the only ones getting a subsidy. The other big thing that seems like it has some potential now and the, the big challenge in, in your lives and in my life is going to be climate change. And it put a value on the externalities. Coal, an old coal plant may be able to produce cheap power, but you're, you're not paying for everything it's producing. The carbon dioxide, some of the sulfur emissions, nitrogen emissions, there's, that's not captured in the price of electricity. And that's part of a free market too, no externalities. And we're not there yet. So. Uh, the biggest thing we'd like to see is the renewal of the production tax credit, which has been on and off. Typically has been bipartisan support. The lead sponsor is Senator Grassley from Iowa, a Republican. There's Republican representatives and governors all over the country that are supporting this. Right now in uh, December 2012, there's really no such thing as bipartisanship. Hopefully that changes. Um, but I think a, a realistic look at our energy picture and where we get our energy sources from uh, we'll show the merits of renewables, and if we're going to lose subsidy, let's lose all subsidies, let's cut externals, externalities, and I think we would be very competitive. So, I forgot to ask you, but if you would be so kind, uh, please tell me a bit about, um, about job prospects in this field uh, for uh, uh, job prospects and what students should have for education. Well, uh, I hope there are a lot of job prospects. I think uh, our, our view is that the next year or two could be difficult and slow for the industry. 2012 has been a banner year for installations. Uh, but beyond that, I, I do believe and I hope that the industry is going to continue growing. So uh, there are wind energy positions for all kinds of people. Um, my own background, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, what's called General Engineering uh, from the University of Illinois, which is a blend of engineering and business. And that served me pretty well to be as a developer, where I have to work with a lot of different parties and understand the science involved and work with different people. Uh, we have uh, lawyers, uh, we have uh, more technical engineering people who do our civil design, our road design, our electrical design. Uh, we have um, all kinds of permitting specialists who work on the project, whether they're uh, you know, biologists in the field looking for birds and bats, uh, or there are archaeologists and uh, historians studying uh, historic uh, resources in any given area. Um, on the operations side, our technicians typically have uh, at least two-year degrees uh, in wind energy uh, technology. Which So we look for people that are good mechanically, uh, good with high voltage, good with computers, uh, in good shape and not afraid of heights. And it is kind of a difficult combination and I think it's relatively way, well uh, paying uh, for, for people with two-year degrees. Um, construction people, you know, there's all kinds of work that goes into construction of these. The civil work, the excavators, the bulldozer operators, the loggers, um, the steel workers or iron workers typically who uh, do the erection of the turbines, electrical workers who run the high voltage lines, um, truck drivers delivering concrete, gravel, wind turbine components. You know, hundreds of jobs created temporarily, locally during construction, and then all the other industries that serve them, gas stations, hotels, restaurants, hardware stores. Uh, and then long term, uh, the technician-wise, the technician jobs that we have, typically there's one technician for every 10 wind turbines at, at a project. So, uh, But with, with a small project, there's going to be a couple other people involved. So I think with the two projects we have in the state now, I think we're something like eight uh, employees total. Uh, with the new project, we probably about double that. Um, so not a huge number, but it, they are relatively uh, well-paying jobs. And Thank you very much. You're welcome. That was excellent.